So for the second talk in this session, um, we're going to um, uh, forward with a talk on um, high co another talk on high content imaging. I want to emphasize that in putting this uh, program together, we were um, we really wanted to cover obviously many different um, um, applications, different countries, but also um, academic and um, uh, industrial research. And so we were um, we're very glad to welcome um, Bart Smets, and Elizabeth uh, Nichol from um, Janssen Pharmaceuticals um, in Belgium. Um, Bart is um, principal data scientist at Janssen. Elizabeth is a data analyst scientist for high content screening. And um, I'm very excited to see their presentation. So I'm going to hand over to, I can see Elizabeth. Bart is here. How are we going to do this, Elizabeth? Um, uh, I'm going to um, try to share my screen and I hope that you uh, can see it. And then if it's, uh, if, uh, Bart will also jump in the conversation um, as we move along. So we can share the same screen, to, uh, same data uh, slides. So okay. can you see my screen already or? Uh... Yeah, we can see your screen, but you're still showing us the, you know, we don't see the slide presentation yet. There we go, perfect. This way, sounds better. I'm gonna search for my pointer as well. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so I wanna start off with uh, a big thank you to the organizer for uh, the, possibility to present our work and uh, welcome you to our presentation on how we are aiming to build a solid data flow um, for high content imaging and uh, machine learning based drug discovery. So some of these um, images will look familiar after Shantanu's talk yesterday, but um, I hope our angle can still bring some information to the table. So uh, high content imaging, as you all know, is a technology that is more than 20 years old. Um, I'm going to just for the sake of uh, bandwidth here at home, stop my video because I tend to have issues sometimes. So if there's questions, I will turn it on again. Um, so from the start, it was clear that uh, the combination of automated microscopy and image analysis can extract rich phenotypic information from different cell culture models. The first publication where it was shown that this information can be used to assess the mode of action of compounds date back to 2004. Nevertheless, a decade later, uh, there was a review that showed that uh, most high content screens still use only one feature from their images to select hits, such as this feature can be intensity feature or a translocation feature, and perhaps also cell count or a similar feature as a toxicity marker. But around the same time, the Carpenter Lab at the Broad Institute established a panel of fluorescent dyes that later became famous as the cell painting protocol. So it uses a panel of six dyes to stain important cell structures and organelles. And from these, you can extract very rich phenotypic information. And it's widely applicable to many cell culture models. So over the last five years, this protocol has demonstrated its usefulness in both small molecule screens and functional genomic screens. And recent efforts combine the cell painting protocol with machine learning, since machine learning tools have now become more widespread and accessible to everyone. So now with this combination, we have the tools at hand to use the rich phenotypic information that we find in images to apply it in machine learning and accelerate or aim to accelerate the drug discovery pipeline. High content imaging and cell painting more specifically is really fast and cost effective. Um, a cost-effective method to generate a biosignature for compounds. If, if you compare it to alternatives such as high-throughput transcriptomics, high content imaging is still more reliable, faster, and cheaper, and the principle is relatively straightforward, as briefly outlined also by Shantanu yesterday. So the cells of interest can be a general cell type, such as a U2OS cell line, uh, which is very widely used, or uh, more specific for your application, for instance, uh, primary and human hepatocytes, if you want to um, use this in a toxicity context, for instance. So you treat your cell line with your compound of interest, you incubate and uh, you stain an image under the microscope, and then you try to extract all possible features within the reach of your software, which can be intensity, cell or nucleus morphology localizations or spatial relationships between compartments and between the cells and everything else you can think of. 
the resulting feature set is, uh, in our case, around 1500 features, um, many of which uh, contain a high degree of correlation. So depending on the application, uh, we perform feature selection and normalize features that have a very different scale. So in general, a biosignature, what we call um, this uh, phenotypic profile, does reflect the mode of action of a particular compound in a cell line. So with this pipeline, you generate, of course, also a ton of data, or you can generate a ton of data. So one of the important questions to ask oneself is how much image data do we actually need to define a good reproducible biosignature? On the left hand, um, we try to establish this with this kind of uh, plot. So on the left hand, um, the y-axis shows the correlation between replicate signatures for a treatment, such a, a, which is a measure for uh, reproducibility. And on the x-axis, you see the Euclidean distance from the control, which is a measure for the phenotypic strength of um, your uh, treatment. So if we look at 25 cells, we see that the signatures are far too noisy. At 200 cells, this starts to be decent, and uh, 500 gives good reproducible signature, which doesn't improve much beyond that. However, since many compounds are often somewhat toxic, you want to image more than 500 cells to account for this. And for U2OS, typically we image four images or four fields of view at a magnification of 20x, and this adds up <clears throat> for a single 1536 plate to about 55 uh, gigabytes. So at the typical size of a high content screen, um, this comes for one screen to about tens to hundreds of terabytes of uh, total data. So an another question um, we also need to assess at the screening scale and over a considerable period of time, it is a major challenge to maintain consistency in cell number, for example. So variability in the cell morphology with very varying density of your culture and with increasing passage number, for instance, also adds to the complication. So here on top, you see the results of uh, three different sites or lab, labs that in essence run the same cell painting protocol and they achieve quite different results. Um, so, so some um, tools like z-score normalization of the features can take away some of the variability here, but definitely not all. And um, one interesting consortium I want to mention is the JumpCP consortium that um, Janssen also takes part in together with 11 other partners and the Broad Institute. Um, they still need to tackle this uh, challenge, for instance, among many others, um, but it will nevertheless be a very interesting journey, uh, which is kicked off recently. Here is one uh, real life example of, our, um, of a small scale cell painting data set. What you see here is the TSNE projection of a 2D, uh, 2 2D of a selected set of reference compounds, and it's based on 66 features that we retrieve from image analysis. So these kind of plots we generate to uh, perform data exploration of compounds, of uh, project compounds, which have an unknown and maybe also unwanted mode of action, and we compare them to, uh, to the reference set with a known mode of action. And um, if, we, if we color code this plot differently, um, then uh, you see, for instance, for this case study, the reference set colored in uh, blue and the project compounds, both of these sets were incubated for 24 hours in prostate cancer cells. The project cluster uh, compounds are colored in uh, yellow. Um, so in addition, we added cells that were incubated with siRNA constructs uh, shown in green to reduce the expression of proteins of interest. And on this particular plot, you can see that we can identify the off-target effects of some uh, project compounds, since some cluster together with tubulin inhibitors here on the left top or Aurora kinase inhibitors here on the right. I can show you that when you uh, when I go one slide back, you see here is a group of tubulin inhibitors and here, for instance, some Aurora kinase inhibitors. And additionally, for the project compounds, we can note uh, cluster number one, which contains some quite toxic compounds, and cluster number two, which does show activity on the target is what we desired. But we already know from other essays, there is also for some of these compounds, some, um, some activity on a sister target, which was uh, unwanted. But in this way, we can assess multiple on-target and off-target effects of 
several chemical series in one single uh, experiment. A small word about the knockdown conditions. So in the ideal case, the knockdown conditions would also cluster together with the compounds of interest to define the desired target profile. But um, here, however, you see this is not the case. And one of the unknown factors is there's uh, different time dynamics of the effect of compounds and of siRNA treatments. So um, that's something that we still need to take into uh, account. We decided for the next round to still incubate for a bit longer time. So instead of 24 hours, we will incubate for 48 hours to assess the time dynamics and see if this might change uh, any of the desired uh, degradation profiles. So this example is uh, useful for more smaller scale experiments, um, but this uh, figure you have seen also yesterday, um, and uh, when we screen at the library scale, this previously shown TSNE plot uh, loses much of its power and especially much of its overview. It gets really, really crowded. So at the library scale, we benefit a lot more from supervised machine learning. And our data warehouse, which is shown in the schematic here at the bottom, this contains a fair amount of information on uh, highly reliable dose response assessments of compounds and in particular more assays. For every assay, only a few thousand compounds are typically tested in dose response. So this is a very sparse data matrix. The matrix of image-based biosignatures shown here um, on top is a full matrix for any compound that is profiled. So the machine learner looks at all the compounds and all the assays at the same time, uh, since it's a multitask learner, and it tries to predict a full activity matrix. Of course, that's not always going to work well, and uh, therefore we statistically test for that and we use the area under the curve of the receiver operating characteristic. Uh, we see that in some 10% of the cases, this prediction amounts to a virtual assay, so it's uh, really uh, good. And in about two thirds of the cases, this is at least good enough to assemble a focused library if desired. So, those are actionable but also testable hypotheses, meaning that you can perform the in vitro testing and then look back with an enriched data set and try to improve your machine learning results. And in this way, try to also speed up the drug discovery process. An important question for us was whether the cell painting protocol feeds in richer and more relevant information into the machine learning algorithms then the repurposing of, um, here you see on the left, older and existing high content screening data sets. And you can see from the figure that the results are uh, encouraging since we find that for the same set of compounds tested, the cell painting protocol supports about two times the number of assay predictions. But what we do not have much control over is which assays will be predicted. And we would of course like to bias that towards the more relevant models for us. We think we can gain something there by adopting more relevant cellular models. So for instance, if you try to predict drug-induced liver injury, there are probably more relevant cellular models than the 2 s cells. And we can also work on which markers we capture and at which resolution. A major factor would also be the selection of compounds to screen and of course what level of predictable data already exists and um, what can be still generated. So with this, I'll hand over to my colleague, Bart, who will say a couple of words more about the uh, structure that all fits with how we generate this data. Uh, thank you, Lisbeth. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for the background noise, but my neighbor just started to renovate his, his house during, during this presentation. So it's one of the pleasures of working at home, I guess. Uh, so I hope I stay understandable during the presentation. Um, so to deal with the increased uh, image generation in the lab that uh, Lisbeth just discussed, we had to also upscale our image analysis and management uh, infrastructure and therefore we migrated um, our systems from our on-prem setup with a couple of uh, single server Columbus instances to an uh, elastically scalable uh, setup that is deployed in AWS. And the slide that you're looking at shows an overview, a high level overview of our current data flow. So after image generation, uh, data are first exported to a local NAS store, which serves as a staging area for the data until data are uploaded to S3, um, Amazon's uh, object storage service. And then for image analysis, we rely on uh, Minos, uh, which at its core is, uh, uses a solution that we developed together with Perk and Elmer. 
and which uses uh, AWS Elastic MapReduce to run the Acapella image analysis jobs on a Spark cluster. Then uh, after image analysis, the results are imported into Fedra. The extracted features we store in Aurora Postgres database and the images uh, are compressed into JPEG 2000 format and are stored in S3. Then FEDRA itself is used uh, for primary analysis of the data to associate the, the data with metadata, such as the compound info, plate layout, and then QC is performed. And then um, yeah, after uh, QC, the QC data together with the metadata, they are extracted from FEDRA and loaded onto an NVIDIA DGX2 instance, which uh, contains a lot of powerful GPUs and which is used for the actual machine learning. Important to notice here is that we are not only performing machine learning on the expected features, but we're also uh, doing machine learning on the raw images itself. So using convolutional neural networks. In that case, only the metadata and the QC is extracted from FEDRA, but the uh, images itself, they are loaded on the DGX2 from the local NAS store or from uh, S3. And you may go to the next slide, Lisbeth. Yeah, thank you. So this shows a bit a more detailed view of MINOS. That's our uh, image analysis uh, component. Uh, it provides a, a single web interface for our scientists across the globe, across our, our different sites to import and annotate image data, to analyze the data and to uh, monitor the status of their data. So at the heart of MINOS is a public API, which is the control center by which all actions are orchestrated. Uh, the file worker on the bottom left it's deployed locally on the NAS and it can be called by the public API to start a copy job to S3. This file worker this contains a, a built-in job management system which can be pulled by the public API to reflect the status of the, the copy job uh, in the uh, MINOS web interface. And at the start of the uh, import job, the public API will also store the metadata linked to the experiment and provided by the uh, scientist into a Postgres database. Then uh, after import of a plate into MINOS and an image analysis job can be started by the analysis worker. And this analysis worker will in fact launch then a Spark EMR cluster, um, which will run the actual a cappella based image analysis. The output of the image analysis is also stored in this tree. And, and once there are no more no scheduled jobs anymore on the uh, EMR cluster, the cluster will automatically shut down. So we're only paying for the uh, compute cost when we actually use them. And then to enable further downstream integration with FEDRA uh, or pre-processing QC application, we make use of a couple of uh, Amazon's automation services. So after completion of a, so a step on the uh, EMR cluster, a CloudWedge event is triggered, which will launch a Lambda job, uh, which will put a SQS message on an SQS queue, will, will put a message on an SQS queue. And this queue is then constantly uh, monitored by FEDRA and as soon as a new plate arrives or a new message arrives on the queue, then that plate is imported in the FEDRA environment. Can you go to the next slide, Lisbeth? So with uh, MINOS, we really try to adhere to as much as possible to a microservice-based architecture, which allows us to scale and, and also to easily deploy individual components at the different locations, at the different sites, and also add additional functionality over time. So for example, at the moment we support uh, a cappella based image analysis, but it's also our ambition to add support for cell profiler uh, to, this, uh, to the MINO system by adding, by building a, a different microservice for that. Uh, this architecture makes it also easier to move towards a continuous and continuous uh, integration, continuous development setup with MINOS and, and containerization of different microservices, which is on the agenda. So, uh, together with deployment uh, of the MINOS system on a Kubernetes backend will also play an important role in this. Uh, all components of MINOS also interact via APIs, which also allows integration with, with other systems uh, within the company and also enables computational scientists to run these pipelines all uh, via, uh, via scripts instead of uh, using the web interface. Currently, all steps after import are already automated in MINOS. Uh, but all, uh, all components are actually in place to really move to a full end-to-end -end automation of the pipeline where MINOS will scan the NAS share for new data and import and analyze new data as soon as they come off the imager. Uh, there is also a lot of focus within Janssen and the industry to make data fair and uh, MINOS also tries to adopt uh, to this concept. So our MINOS metadata model is aligned to the central Janssen metadata model, which allows integration with our uh, company-wide data catalogs 
and this way the voice that minus uh, will become an isolated and inaccessible uh, data silo. And then finally, in the table on the bottom, I just uh, added that to give you some idea of the throughput that we reached so far with MINOS in, in 2020. Uh, numbers that we wouldn't be able to reach with our uh, on-prem setup and the numbers, of course, that's also without COVID would, uh, would have been a lot higher. And with that, I want to hand over back to Lisbeth to, to conclude our presentation. Thank you. Yeah. As a at the end of the presentation, we still want to uh, emphasize that we, of course, uh, Bart and I did not do this alone. Uh, this is uh, this effort is not possible without a smooth collaboration between different teams of uh, different disciplines. So it takes a global multidisciplinary team to make this ambitious plan a reality. Um, therefore, I'd like to thank um, the people from um, the image analysis and data analysis and machine learning group, that's people of the high dimensional biology and uh, discovery data sciences team. Um, major efforts also go in from um, the discovery technologies and molecular pharmacology, non-clinical safety and functional genomics. They are enable us to uh, generate high quality data and um, Essential and absolutely critical is support of uh, IT for all image analysis and data analysis pipelines to be set up for uh, this to run very smoothly and um, to make it really um, at production scale, so to say. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening as well. And uh, we can take some questions if we still have time, I think so, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll do the clap. Um, Thanks. Can press their clap buttons. Um, that's great. I, we're going to do questions. Um, I, I just want to, um, I know several of you, for example, in the East Coast and the West Coast of the US are about to run out for coffee, etc. I understand that. However, we do have a bit of a surprise for you. So if you can just hang on there for just a couple of minutes after questions, that would be great. Um, I'll go over the questions in the chat. Um, Anne Carpenter, um, you had a question for Elizabeth. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I, you were showing this case study about the um, me learning mechanisms of actions of hits out of screens and assessing potentially their toxicity and whether they overlap with the knockdowns. I was curious whether this is just um, a proof of principle or if this is something that Janssen now does for every single project that comes through the pipeline. Uh, I don't know if you're, uh, if you're able to comment on that, but I was uh, very curious to what extent this has become everyday practice or is it still like, oh, here's a neat thing we can do sometimes? Um, let's say for my day-to-day -day life, it's everyday practice, but it's of course not all of the, uh, all of the projects that are going, going on at Janssen. Um, at larger scale or more profiling scale, we do want to use much of the data for machine learning uh, purposes, since that, that of course is uh, the real strength of these large data sets. But this profiling is definitely of smaller scale, scale data sets, there can also be a lot of information gained from that. But it's not like we do that for every specific project. It really depends on the needs of the project and where they are, uh, in which stage they are of the, of the discovery. So if they're, if they're uh, profiling still in the screening mode or if they're already into lead optimization, it really depends. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Um, we can have a list here of Prem Paul Gilleton from France. Do you want to turn on your camera? There's, there's Prem. Great. Oh, so I'm not sure my camera is working, but okay, my, my question is super simple. Okay. So uh, thanks for the presentation. And um, uh, do you have any link or information um, on the web uh, about Minus if you want further information? Um, that is broken, quite broken. Did Lisbeth, were you able to get that or Bart? Uh, yes, I yeah. think Bart can probably answer that question better. Yeah, so I, no, I'm sorry, I'm not able to share a link for Minos. That's really the, that's how we baptized the internal system that we developed. So it's, it's just the Janssen internal system. If, if you want, I think you can certainly follow offline and, and uh, well, go in a bit more detail and show you what it's able to do. But it's, it's uh, at the moment, it's just a Janssen internal uh, system. So it's uh, uh, Fedra, if you're interested in that, that that's an uh, open source software that has been developed within Janssen and has been open source in the meantime. Maybe Minos long term will go the same way, but at the moment we're not uh, at this stage yet. So it's, it's purely uh, Janssen internal software. 
Claire um, Brown has pasted the document, just a, um, excuse me, a link um, about um, research data management dictionary, some of the uh, terms that one comes across. Um, might want to look at that. Um, maybe a question, I have a question uh, for uh, perhaps Elizabeth. Um, as you're looking at the feature sets that are coming out of these um, analyses, are you seeing common features that are crossing cell lines or, or effectively are each of the biological entities that you're working with effectively different? Uh, I haven't looked at it in that way um, to see if there are really common, um, but yeah, I mean, many of, of very often it, it's uh, features related to the to the nucleus of course very, very often it's something something to do with the with the dapier host staining that that comes back a lot i have to say so uh, i think that 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 that's already a really important one but other than that it depends um yeah dep i didn't look at it that way uh yet but what i can say is that for qc purposes we do um, have some key features which we look at and take uh, take along over the different uh, over the different screens and that's usually intensity of the different dyes or um, coefficient of variance of the different dyes or the or the intensity of the of the Hux, um signal to see if there's not too much going wrong or with the with the parameters um, yeah that's great okay thank you.